Greetings to your friends. Here we are on the 4th of July weekend, Independence Day, and we continue to shelter in place, in fact, more so than ever, as the governor of California has, during this past week, uh, imposed stricter limitations on gatherings and getting together. So our celebration of the 4th of July will this year be much, much different than it has been in years in the past. Still, we are getting together as a congregation to celebrate, to celebrate God's goodness and to celebrate the freedom that we have, not only as people who are part of the United States of America, but the freedom we enjoy to obey and to listen to and to love and be loved by our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor Jim Holm, and I am the pastor of the Faith Community Congregation of the Butler Church in Fresno. And we're coming to you th by this means because uh, we want to bring our church and our service and our worship into your home. So I invite you to join with us. We'll have some music and the spoken word. And if you want to get a Bible so you can follow along a bit later, I'll be speaking this morning from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, and then on to the end of the chapter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. So I invite you to join us. We're glad to have you with us, and may God bless this time we have together. In the name of Jesus. Well, we've come again to another celebration of the 4th of July, Independence Day, the commemoration of the event that began the Declaration of Independence and led to the formation of the United States of America. And frequently here in our country, this celebration of Independence Day is a celebration of strength and of power. And so often you will hear or see the military jets flying overhead above stadiums and arenas packed with hundreds of people who have come to celebrate. There, of course, are fireworks and the red, white, and blue bunting and colors flying everywhere and people having flags out on the front of their house or in uh, uh, public places. 
celebrating and honoring the strength and the might and the history of the United States of America. And most of us, most of us are proud to be Americans. Most of us are glad to be a part of this country. I can't speak for all of you, but I've had the privilege of traveling in some other countries. And while there are many beautiful places in the world and many wonderful people in those places, I have never really had a strong desire to live anywhere else rather than in this country. And so I join with others on the 4th of July in feeling a certain sense of patriotism, a certain sense of pride in uh, being a part of this country, and a real sense of gratitude for the freedom and for the privileges which we have enjoyed here. And so along with most Americans, Independence Day is for me, as I suppose it is for you, a, a time to give thanks to God. Now that's not to suggest that America doesn't have problems. We know quite uh, uh, obviously that there are problems. We've seen them just in the past months with the concerns about racial uh, violence and reconciliation and of course the ongoing spread of the pandemic which seems to be getting worse right now rather than better. So there are issues and we have a president, presidential election coming up this fall and of course no one knows today what the outcome of that will be and how that will affect the future of this nation. So there, there are problems, there are issues, still we join with other Americans in celebrating this holiday. What I want to do this morning, though, is to take a look at independence in a little different way. And I want to do that through a passage of scripture that I'm going to just share with you in a moment. I want to ask some questions about how we as Christians particularly view our role in the United States of America. What do we who have declared Jesus to be our Lord and God to be our King, how do we respond to the kinds of things that are said and done during Independence Day in America. How do we celebrate independence? We know that America celebrates with strength. We have parades, we have marching bands, we have uh, announcements from public people about how America is the strongest and the richest and the mightiest and the healthiest country in the world. And many of us Christians join in those celebrations. We believe Many Christians believe that America must be strong in order to be uh, influential and in order to carry out its mission in the world. Well, today I want to raise with you a passage that confronts how Christians ought to be and how they ought to live and looks at this whole issue of what independence means in a very stark and dramatic way. And I suggest that the passage I'm about to share with you is primarily for believers. That is, it is for people who accept and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is not the kind of passage that one would, I think, preach to an audience of non-believers and say, you really need to hear this. Or that one would take to the leaders of America and say, this is for you. This is what you really need to know. While it might have some appropriate application in those kinds of settings, it really is a passage directed squarely to those persons, people like you, like me, who claim Jesus Christ as Lord and who say we want to live our lives after his pattern and after his model. And it has a lot to do with how we celebrate and whether or not we emphasize strength when we celebrate as we do in America on Independence Day. The passage that I'm having reference to is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. And it's a passage that is striking in its force and in its impact. And we'll talk together about whether it's striking for us in its application this morning. So if you do have a Bible and you want to follow along, I invite you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading here in verse 21, and then continue on to the end of the chapter. And this is what we read. 1 Peter 2, 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, 
but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter is hardly the person to write about following an example of Jesus who when he suffered did not or when he was reviled did not revile in return and when he suffered he uttered no threat. Peter was a person who did not believe in suffering in silence. In fact, when Jesus was with his disciples earlier before his crucifixion and he would talk to them about the fact that someday he was going to go to the cross and he was going to be executed, he was going to die, he was going to be rudely treated, spit on, beaten, and so on. Peter couldn't stand that. In fact, the text tells us in the Gospels that Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, no, Lord, that's not how it's going to be. Don't talk nonsense like that. Don't say such foolish things. You're not going to be beaten up. You're not going to be killed. That's not going to happen to you. In fact, Peter was so vehement in his denunciation of what Jesus was saying that Jesus finally took Peter aside and said, get behind me, Satan, because Peter was speaking the words of the devil rather than the words of God. And Jesus wanted him to understand that. But Peter was a person who was strong-willed, who wanted strength, who didn't understand and didn't like when Jesus talked about weakness. And then later on, on the night before he was to be betrayed and crucified, Jesus said to Peter, as the disciples were together at dinner, Jesus said to Peter, tonight you are going to deny three times that you even know me. And Peter puffed out his chest and stood up straight and said, no, 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 I won't do that. The other people here, they may be like that, but I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll never deny you. But of course, as we know the story, he certainly did. The very next day, Peter couldn't go into hiding fast enough when it came time to identify whether he was with Jesus or not. So Peter was a person who loved to talk about how strong he was, about how strong people should be, and yet, by the time he writes this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, he has learned something about where real strength comes from. And it doesn't come from puffing out your chest. It doesn't come from asserting how big you are, how powerful you are. And in America's case, it may not even come from describing how many missiles you have or how many bombs you can drop or how many submarines have uh, power to destroy. And what Peter writes now in 1 Peter chapter 2 is that Jesus is an example which we are to follow. Let me remind you of what he said. This he said in verse 21, To this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Instead of stopping Jesus from suffering, as he had earlier, Peter now uh, endorsed, Peter now adopted Jesus' posture on suffering in the face of opposition. And in fact, he said Jesus was to be an example for us. The exact words he used were, you are to follow in his steps. And that means to actually put your feet in the footprints of Jesus, walking step by step as Jesus did. So Peter begins by writing to these people, Christ left you an example. Now that we have to keep in mind all through the rest of this passage, that Jesus is an example. He is an example we are to follow. He is an example we are to emulate. We are to walk in his steps. And so everything else we will read in these next few verses has that as the background. Jesus is our example. So how was he an example? Well, go on and listen to what Peter says now in verse 22. 
He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. How do you summarize that verse in one short phrase? This is what you would say. Jesus did not retaliate. Jesus did not retaliate. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Jesus did not get even. He did not assert his strength. He did not demonstrate his power. Now, he could have. We know that Jesus had a great deal of power. He once told his disciples, don't you know that if I wanted to, I could ask my father and he would send thousands of angels to protect me and to take care of me. So it wasn't that Jesus didn't have power, but when he suffered real abuse, when he was assaulted verbally, when he was assaulted physically, he did not retaliate. And remember again, Peter is saying, he was an example that we might follow in his steps. Well, it's one thing to say Jesus did not retaliate, what then did he do when there was opposition, when there was frustration? How did he protect himself? How did he defend himself if he chose non-retaliation as his first line of response? Well, here's what Peter says. He kept entrusting himself to him, that is God. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So in the midst of attack, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of reviling and despising, Jesus trusted God, understanding that God could be trusted. Jesus is our example, and our example is non-retaliation. And if you look at Jesus' response when he stood before Pilate and before the Jewish authorities, most of the time, the text tells us he remained silent. He trusted, he handed himself over to God. He preferred trusting God to retaliating against his enemies. He remembered that God was fair and he trusted God to act fairly. Now think about that when you're thinking about a nation on Independence Day. The thing we celebrate about our nation it is, is that we are armed to the teeth, that our armies are more powerful, that our air forces are stronger, that our navies uh, have more potency. And so we tell the North Koreans, we tell the Iraqis, we tell the Syrians, we tell the terrorists, we tell even the demonstrators on our streets, our power is greater than yours. Our president constantly reminds us Americans and other countries of how powerful we are and how able to crush those who would stand in opposition to us. But Peter says Jesus did not retaliate. Instead, he entrusted himself to God who judges righteously. He believed that God would see that right won out in the end, that God would do the right thing. Now, I remind you again that this passage is written primarily for Christians. This is not a passage you would preach to America. It is not a passage you would preach to a room full of people who didn't believe. But for people who choose Christ, Peter says he is our example. However, we've covered only half the story. We have seen what Jesus did not do. That is, he did not retaliate, but entrusted himself to God. But those were all sort of passive responses. What did he do on the active side? Well, Peter goes on to talk about that as well in verse 24, and this is what he says. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 
Now that's what Jesus did on the positive side when he was attacked. And what does that mean? How do we interpret what he just wrote for us? Well, here's what Jesus did. He put himself between the attacker and the ones being attacked. He took our sins in his body, Peter says, that we might live to righteousness. And he died. So what Jesus did in terms of responding to evil, to attack, to being reviled, to being despised, to being rejected, what he did was to step in between those who were being attacked, that is us, to take our sin and to stand between us and the one who was attacking us. Sin and evil and the devil. Jesus interposed his person between the attack and the ones being attacked. That's the example for us. He put himself between danger and the ones to whom that danger came. He bore our sins that we might live. Otherwise, we would have died in sin. Otherwise, we would have been attacked by the devil. Otherwise, we would have been overcome. We would have died. But instead, by going to the cross, by suffering and dying for us, the power of evil was broken and we received righteousness. And Peter says that's our example. On the negative side, Jesus did not retaliate against those who attacked. On the positive side, he put himself between the evil and the ones who the evil had come to get. And he's our example. Now, since this is Independence Day, and since we celebrate the strength of America, let's talk about how this passage applies to us as believers. What does it mean for us? Does Jesus' example of non-retaliation really work in our day? Would it work better on a personal level if you and I decided we didn't have to defend ourselves against every attack? If you and I decided that the way in which we would obey God is not to retaliate, but to trust ourselves to God, who cares for and who works things out rightly for those who love and follow Him. Let me pose some questions to you that you and I might think about and perhaps even have opportunity to talk about together. For example, as a follower of Jesus, should I carry a weapon of some sort so that I can retaliate against anyone who is attacking me? That is, should I have a weapon such as a handgun in my pocket or my purse that enables me to inflict hurt on someone else? Or did Peter mean in those kinds of situations that I entrust myself to God, even putting myself in danger in order to protect others? Expanding the question a little farther, should Christians carry weapons in church so that in case some person with evil intent comes into the church and starts doing evil things, shooting or attacking, we can pull out our weapons and bring that person's life to an end. We can retaliate, we can defend, we can get even. Or does this passage of scripture have implication in settings like that? Many Christians are devoted to defending the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the right to keep and bear arms. But should that be a major focus for us? Or should we say, no, Jesus did not retaliate. Instead, he trusted God and he put himself in front of the danger to protect the victims. When I was in college, we used to uh, have those late night debates that college students have, particularly when they live in the dorms and they can stay up all night talking about the important issues of life. And of course, 
don't have much responsibility at that time to change things, but at least you can dream. And so when I was in college and we would stay up late and we would argue about how much Jesus is our example and how much we ought to follow what he says, one of the questions that always came up was, well, suppose someone broke into your house and attack, attacked your wife or your children. Shouldn't you have a gun on hand in order to shoot them and to stop your family from being assaulted or at least a sturdy baseball bat or a cudgel of some kind? Well, of course, those were all hypothetical questions because for all of us in college, that had never really happened. So we didn't know for sure what we would do. But if we read Peter seriously, and if in fact Jesus is our example, and if in fact our, our goal is not to uh, fight back against evil, but rather to protect those whom evil would attack, then would one say from this passage that you put yourself between the attacker and those who you wish to protect? How do those Christians who serve in the military deal with this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2? If Jesus is their example, how do they respond? How do they work it out for themselves? How do we vote on the defense budget? How do we encourage our congressmen and women to vote on the way in which our country is defended? How do we who love Jesus handle this stark truth? He is our example that we should follow in his steps. Is it true only on a personal level and only in certain kinds of situations? Are there circumstances where retaliation is the right response and where Peter's words simply do not apply? Or would it be possible even on a national level sometimes to say there are other alternatives rather than demonstrating how strong we are, how mighty our weapons are, how powerfully we can destroy those who oppose us? Is freedom always best defended by the strongest, the richest, the wealthiest, the ones with the largest guns and the biggest weapons? Or is freedom more protected, more insured, when we all recognize that we live under the sovereignty of God? And particularly for us as Christians, that we are not bound by the ways that people in our culture usually think. But we live differently. We choose not to retaliate, but to put ourselves between the danger and those whom it would attack. I love this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, but it also frightens me. And yet Peter says, Jesus is your example that you should follow in his steps. And Jesus is especially our example when it's hard to follow him. How much does it cost? Well, it costs Jesus his life. Instead of calling down angels to defend himself, he chose to put himself between sin and us, the victims who would deserve to die and he died instead. Non-retaliation is the standard. Putting ourselves in place to protect those who uh, depend on us by absorbing the evil ourselves rather than fighting and responding is what Peter teaches. How this works on Independence Day? Well, we'll still need to have conversation about that. But it's a passage to be taken seriously, to be reflected upon, and to be obeyed. May God help us to understand his word, to know how it applies to us, and to know how to make it clear to one another. Amen.
Well, that brings our service to an end for uh, another week. And I want to thank you for joining us today on this Independence Day weekend. The text that we have looked at, as you have heard and as you've read it yourself, is a difficult text because it challenges us to a way of life that doesn't come naturally. It's not the kind of people we want to be by nature, and it's not the kind of people that most in our country choose to be. And so when Christ calls us to be different than the rest, a passage like this is a really strong and in some cases severe challenge for us. So as you think about what we've shared, I hope it will continue to uh, resonate in your life and that the Spirit of God will help you to know how you can apply it to your own situation and to the circumstances that we see as a nation around this Independence Day. Again, thank you for joining us. It's been really good to share these words with you. And I thank you for taking the time to watch us at home or wherever you may have been. And it looks like we'll be here in this format for a while, so I hope to see you again next Sunday or next weekend as we spend some time together. And until then, I pray that God will richly bless you, that he will apply the word to your life and to mine, and that we will grow spiritually as we think about these things. On behalf of all of us at Faith Community Congregation, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, thanks for being a faithful part of this family. May God bless you through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>